Hi, my name is Anya Keeler and I'm one of the radiologists at the Ottawa Hospital. Today I'll be talking about contrast use and stuff we should all know. This talk will be in five parts. The first part is on CT contrast agents. The second part is on contrast induced nephropathy due to CT agents. The third part is on MRI contrast agents. The fourth part is on nephrogenic systemic fibrosis due to contrast agents used for MRI, and the fifth part is treatment of contrast reactions. So for part one, we will con cover what are CT contrast agents, what types are available, and what are their uses. First, we must cover the topic of spatial resolution versus contrast resolution. The ideal imaging modality would have both high spatial resolution and high contrast resolution, but we know that that is not always possible in radiology. Spatial resolution is the ability to see small details. So the smaller objects that a modality can resolve as being two separate structures, the better the spatial resolution. So the best spatial resolution that we have is plain f screen film radiography. The spatial resolution is 0.08 millimeters. This is compared to digital radiography, which is still good. Next is CT, which has a spatial resolution of 0.4 millimeters. MRI, which has a spatial resolution of approximately, and PET scanning, which is even higher. Contrast is the ability to discern various shades of gray. So just as in life, in radiology, things are not necessarily black and white, but various shades of gray. Contrast resolution depends on the imaging modality and the tissue being evaluated. For example, a chest x-ray and an abdominal x-ray is the same modality, but the tissues have different contrast resolution intrinsic to them, and that's why the images appear different. On the other hand, if we compare an abdominal x-ray to an abdominal CT scan, we have the same type of tissue that we're looking at, but different modalities which allow differences in contrast Iodine is the compound which is found within the various CT scan dyes that we use. And iodine has a high molecular weight compared to carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, which is found in most tissues. As a result, the iodine has higher absorption of X-ray photons compared to the surrounding tissues. The contrast resolution of various tissues increases within the different tissues depending on the concentration of the iodine at a particular time. When we inject the iodine, it goes first from the vein, through the heart, eventually into the arteries, arterioles, capillaries, tissues, and then back into the veins and back to the heart. And depending on the timing of the CT scan, we can maximize the contrast resolution in various tissues. So most often, we have been using Omnipake. There are other types of dyes as well, but if you look at this particular compound, there's a fair amount of iodine attached to these molecules. The ideal contrast agent would be water-soluble, with low osmolality, low viscosity, with no allergic potential, with selective excretion through whichever organ of choice we had. It would be non-toxic and inexpensive. Over time, we have been working towards these goals. However, I will go through some of the history of what contrast agents were available and what we use more often now. So in the past, high osmolality contrast media were developed followed by low or iso-osmolal contrast media. These media could be non-ionic monomers, non-ionic dimers, ionic dimers, and ionic monomers. Osmolality is a measure of the number of dissolved particles in a solvent. So if we have a solvent with low osmolality, which we put into another container, the molecules will go into this smaller container in order to make an equilibrium with it. If we put a smaller container into a larger container, and the smaller container, which is permeable, has high osmolality, the molecules will have a net efflux out of the smaller container into the surrounding container. This will occur until equal osmolality is achieved on both sides. This is what typically happens in our cells with influx of efflux of water and electrolytes. Now ionic contrast agents typically have a higher osmolality than the blood, so they will cause water to come in or solutes such as themselves to go out. 
When a hyperosmolar solution is injected into the bloodstream, the red blood cells shrink and become deformed and more rigid. Endothelial cells surrounding the vessels also shrink and create gaps in previously tight vessel junctions. This leads to fluid entering from the extravascular space into the blood vessels, causing vasodilation. This was the situation with high osmolar solution. As a result, less osmolar solutions have been developed in the interim. So the normal osmolality of blood is 310 milliosmoles per kilogram. In normal saline, the red blood cells have a normal appearance since the osmolality of normal saline is 290 milliosmoles per kilogram. With low osmolar concentrations of solutions such as visipaque, which is what is used more commonly now, the red cells are not that deformed. The more commonly used omnipaque, which is called low osmolar, but is actually higher because the density, because the um, concentration is 780 milliosmoles per kilogram, you can see that some of the red blood cells are becoming deformed. And with the old types of high osmolar contrast agents, such as hypake, which had an osmolality more than twice of omnipaque, the red blood cells were very much deformed. Early on, hyperosmolar ionic monomers were used, which had high osmolality in compared to the blood, which is approximately 300. And these were associated with higher cardiac and renal complications. Examples of these were Hypake and Conray. Newer agents were linked to two iodinated benzene rings rather than just one, forming a larger molecule with a resulting low, lower osmolality. An example of this is Visipake, which is essentially isoosmolal to the blood. In patients with chronic renal failure, the osmolality of the contrast material or medium is one of the factors in inducing contrast-induced nephropathy, and therefore Visipake has often been used in those patients. This is an example of the ionic contrast agents used previously. This was Hypake, which was a very high osmolality contrast agent. This was Hexabrix, which was one of the lower osmolality contrast agents, but it was still ionic and therefore it dissociates into two molecules. So here we have three iodine uh, particles per molecule. And on the right, in Hexabrix, we have six iodine molecules per particle. And the osmolality of both of these particles is 2 because there will be a side chain which dissociates in the ionic contrast. On the other hand, in the non-ionic contrast agents, we had a monomer such as Omnipake, which is commonly used. It has three iodine side chains, as well as three other side chains in the benzene ring, compared to the Visipake, which has two of these benzene rings attached, and thus there are six iodine molecules per osmotically active particle. So these second generation lower isoosmolar contrast agents initially had a contrast osmolality of 6 to 850 milliosmoles per kilogram, such as Omnipake. The ionic ones were twice that because they dissociate. And the non-ionic didn't dissociate, so they were lower and better. And then the dimers, which are the ultra-low Visipake examples, have the lowest osmolality of all contrast agents, having six iodine atoms per particle in solution. And these are the ones that are often used in patients with Renner. Part 2 is contrast-induced nephropathy and CT agents. So contrast-induced nephropathy is defined as acute renal impairment, which occurs within 48 to 72 hours after exposure to intravenous radiographic contrast material. All contrast agents are potential sources of renal complications, as I showed in the earlier slides with the deformation of the cells and changes in osmolality and fluid shifts in the body. And approximately one quarter of all patients over 70 years old have some degree of chronic renal failure, and many of them are not even aware of it. The higher the volume of contrast agent used, the higher the risk of contrast-induced nephropathy in at-risk patients. Even small volumes of contrast 
can cause contrast-induced nephropathy, especially when the creatinine clearance is very low. So once we inject the IV contrast, how do the kidneys handle it? So after injection of IV dye, contrast first passes from the intravascular space in the blood to the extracellular space, and an equilibrium develops around two hours. Half-life is also two hours for elimination of contrast agents, and 99% is eliminated by the kidneys. So normally 20% of the cardiac output goes to the kidneys, and most of the filtration occurs through glomerular capillary walls in Bowman's capsule. A decrease in GFR correlates with increasing severity of kidney disease. So normally the blood comes in through the afferent arterial, comes out through the efferent arterial, and filtration occurs at Bowman's capsule. It crosses through the proximal tubule. There's various absorptions and then secretions which occur here, and finally urine. What can happen to the kidneys when contrast is administered? There's a number of factors which can occur which can lead to increasing kidney damage, although this does not happen to everybody. Osmotic diuresis can occur, vasoconstriction leading to ischemia, direct toxicity of the iodine causing tubular damage, and oxygen-free radical formation, and this can lead to a further reduction in GFR. The incidence of contrast-induced nephropathy is at less than 2% in the general population, but it is much higher in patients who have pre-existing renal failure. Contrast-induced nephropathy is associated with longer stay in the hospital, increased morbidity and mortality, and increased progression to dialysis. Mortality and progression to dialysis. In most patients, contrast-induced nephropathy is a self-limited process. The peak increase in creatinine occurs at 4 to 5 days and usually goes back to baseline by 10 days. However, if patient's creatinine increases by 50 micromoles per liter, in-house or in-hospital mortality increases to 4%. Of all comers, dialysis is required in less than 0.7% of patients, and this is in patients with underlying kidney disease who may not know about it. Of the patients who do require dialysis, however, mortality increases to 35% in the acute setting with a 19% two-year survival. Now what is normal GFR? Well, normal is over 85 milliliters per minute. We don't typically worry about patients if they have a creatinine clearance of over 60. We consider moderate disease at 30 to 60 mils per minute, severe disease at 15 to 29 mils per minute, and typically end stage or dialysis is at less than 15 milliliters per minute. The National Kidney Foundation Clinical Practice Guidelines for Chronic Diseases of the kidneys have been developed, and their diagram here is similar to what I showed on the pri prior slide. And basically, patients with stage 3, 4, and 5 disease are the ones that we're most interested in. And kidney function is measured in milliliters per minute, assuming a 1.73 meter square surface area of the body. So which patients are at risk for contrast-induced nephropathy? First of all, patients with a, a pre-existing renal impairment are at increased risk, and this is the biggest risk factor. Patients with underlying diabetes, especially if it's with coexisting renal impairment. Patients with volume depletion due to vomiting, diarrhea, other causes of dehydration or diuretic use. Patients with congestive heart failure, hypertension, multiple myeloma. Patients using nephrotoxic drugs such as NSAIDs, aminoglycoside antibiotics, and cisplatinum, and the L. How do we determine a patient's GFR? There are different ways of doing it. The first way is to do a 24-hour urine collection, but this is not practical because it's inconvenient for the patient and takes a long time. Next is measurement of plasma creatinine, but this has been shown not to be very representative. It depends on patient lean body mass, so it can be overestimated in patients with large body mass due to fat and can be underestimated in cachectic patients. The GFR also varies with patient's age and whether they're male or female. Creatinine clearance is a closer estimation of the proper GFR, but an estimated GFR is now the preferred. There are different ways of calculating both creatinine clearance and estimated GFR. The Cockcroft and Gold estimate has been used in the past, which takes into account the patient's age and their weight, as well as whether they're male or female. There is a website where they did a study called the MDRD study, which allows input of patient's age, whether they're African-American, 
male or female, and their and this is the most um, useful way of estimating the GFR. This is the website, and these are the things that you fill out in order to get the estimated GFR. So estimated GFR has been shown to not reliably predict the actual GFR in patients whose creatinine clearance is greater than 60 milliliters per minute. However, these are patients in whom the risk of contrast-induced nephropathy is quite low, and so we are not concerned with that. It still has a fairly high confidence inter interval in the other ranges, but it is still the most useful and fastest way to do it, that is, to measure the creatinine. It does not necessarily present predict GFR in patients who are at the extremes of age, weight, in patients who are amputees, and in patients with sudden changes of creatinine function. But it's still more accurate than creatinine clearance and certainly more useful than just measuring the creatinine. So strategies to reduce contrast-induced nephropathy. So in patients who have a creatinine clearance of greater than 60 mL per minute, there's no specific intervention required. In those who have creatinine clearances between 30 and 60 or less than 30, we have several options. For those who have low to moderate risk for contrast-induced nephropathy, either oral or IV hydration is recommended. Use of low osmolar contrast medium, such as Visipaic. Consider using an acetylcysteine, which I'll discuss shortly, and checking the serum creatinine after two days to make sure that there is no elevation. In those patients who have a very low estimated glomerular filtration rate. These are the moderate to high risk patients. They should receive IV hydration and they should have use of a low osmolal agent such as Visipaque. The contrast should not be done if, necess if not necessary and consideration should strongly be made for use of either sodium bicarbonate or an acetylcysteine which again I'll discuss shortly. Follow-up serum creatinine and electrolyte levels is recommended two days later. N-acetylcysteine is thought to possibly prevent renal tubular toxicity due to its antioxidant characteristics. Mucomus scavenges oxygen-free radicals, and it forms a sulfhydryl compound which reduces oxygen-free radical formation in the first place. It is controversial whether this is helpful, and some studies have been published which show some benefit, whereas others are inconclusive. One of the studies by Marenzi et al. in New England Journal of Medicine in 2006 showed that in patients who got N-acetylcysteine before and twice daily for 48 hours after contrast agents versus those who got a double dose versus those who they found that elevation of creatinine was seen in 33% of the patients who got placebo, 15% of those who got the normal dose of N-acetylcysteine, and only 8% of those who got the double dose. So this was felt to be a positive result. So their conclusion was that intravenous or oral N-acetylcysteine may prevent contrast-induced nephropathy, but that there is a dose dependent. Prevention of contrast-induced nephropathy has also been investigated using various types of fluids for hydration. So it is recommended that patients are either orally or intravenously hydrated depending on their creatinine clearance or estimated GFR. So they looked at using sodium bicarb versus sodium chloride for intravenous hydration. They defined patients as having CIN if their serum creatinine elevated by more than 25% within two days of receiving a contrast enhanced CT scan and they compared the rate of contrast-induced nephropathy in patients who had received sodium bicarb to sodium chloride. They had 119 patients, half got one, half got sodium chloride, at a rate of 3 mL per kilogram for one hour before the CT scan, and for one mL per kilogram per hour for six hours after the procedure. They concluded that hydration with sodium bicarb before contrast exposure is more effective than hydration with sodium chloride for prophylaxis of CIN, and they felt that this may be due to the reduction of the pH of the blood and an acid solution or environment may increase toxicity by production of oxygen free radical as, as well as other more complex mechanisms. This is a fairly controversial topic. So in conclusion, contrast agents should be used wisely. If they're not necessary, don't use them. However, they do help in characterizing a lot of lesions and areas of abnormality. So 
The patients must be screened properly. So patients who are older, diabetic, at risk, should have their creatinines checked. Patients who do have risk should be treated appropriately, either by using mucomist, so N-acetylcysteine, other types of hydration, possibly with sodium bicarbonate, decreasing the dose of the contrast agent used, and making sure that it's one of the low osmolality, non-ionic contrast agents. Also, if patients are taking diuretics or nephrotoxic agents, these should be held. In patients with moderate to severe chronic renal failure, a follow-up creatinine level and plasma potassium level should be done in 48 to 72 hours. And also, if the creatinine is elevated, a consultation with nephrology should be considered if a CT scan is really needed, but the creatinine clearance or estimated GFR is very poor. The next topic is MRI contrast agents. So we will review commonly used agents, other types of less commonly used contrast agents, and touch on some of the agents which are not available in North America. So how does MRI work? Well, basically, the patient and their tissues are placed in a magnetic field, which is 1.5 Tesla, which is thousands of times stronger than the regular Earth's magnetic field. And when the patient is placed in this, the protons, which are in our hydrogen atoms, align with the direction of the magnetic field, about one in a million net. So it's not that all of the molecules are aligning, just one in a million on average is aligned in the direction of the magnet. Once this has happened, a radio frequency energy pulse is applied at a 90 degree angle, which causes these protons to go to a new higher energy state. When the pulse is turned off, these hydrogen protons try to return to their original relaxed state, which is in the direction of the magnet. Depending on how quickly they're able to get back to this re relaxed state, their energy that they emit is different, and we can use mathematical equations to get an idea of which hydrogen molecules are surrounded by which types of molecule, whether, that, whether the hydrogen is in water or in fat or in other tissues, and this is what gives the contrast resolution in M Why do we use contrast agents in MRI when the contrast resolution is already pretty good? Well. The contrast agents, just like in CT, increase the contrast resolution even more. They can be used to enhance the ability to differentiate normal from abnormal tissues. They can define and characterize various lesions. They increase our sensitivity and diagnostic conference, confidence. They demonstrate abnormal vascularity in tissues and can be used for detecting stenosis and degree of stenosis. In this case here, we have an example of a patient with metastatic disease to the spine. On the T1-weighted images on the left, which do not have contrast, we have the spine, which is gray, the vertebral bodies, and very low signal intensity metastases to the actual vertebral bodies themselves. On the image on the right, in the same patient, gadolinium has been injected, and we can see these metastases quite well, but we can also see that there's abnormal signal intensity and abnormal tissue extending into the spinal canal itself, causing a cauda equina syndrome. This would be very difficult to determine from this unenhanced MRI. So MR contrast agents can either be positive contrast agents, which are bright on T1-weighted images, or negative contrast agents, meaning they look dark on T2-weighted images. So the most typically used imaging contrast agent is gadolinium, which is a positive contrast agent. So we can classify MR agents based on their magnetic properties, on their biodistribution, and their image enhancement. For example, magnetic properties, typically we use paramagnetic substances such as gadolinium-based agents, but we can also use superparamagnetic uh, structures such as superparamagnetic iron oxide, which is a type of contrast agent which is a negative predominantly T2 shortening agent. The biodistribution can be extracellular, intravascular, so staying in the blood pool, which is very good for doing MR angiograms, or it can be tissue specific. So positive MRI contrast agents, these paramagnetic contrast agents improve tissue discrimination on MRI by improving the contrast resolution. Gadolinium is typically what's used, and it's a metallic element in the periodic table. However, the problem with gadolinium is that it's very toxic. 
the engineers over time have managed to chelate it to another molecule and therefore it does not interact with our tissues and it's excreted from the kidneys over a 24-hour period. This is an example of one of these ions that have chelated the gadolinium. So this is a very large pro uh, particle in which the gadolinium ion is sheltered and it reduces the chance of toxicity. Gadolinium enhances the contrast between tissues in which it accumulates, just like iodine does in CT. It causes faster T1 relaxation properties of tissues which have protons which are near the gadolinium, and this increases contrast enhancement on T1 weighted images. We have numerous gadolinium-based contrast agents which are available from various companies. Most commonly used is OmniScan. However, we also use Prohance, Magnavist, and Multihance. OmniScan has been most commonly used in North America for multiple purposes. There's a wide range of indications, including pediatric CNS and abdominal. Multihance, which is a different type of contrast agent, also has early and high T1 relaxivity and has even better enhancement of intraaxial brain tumors compared to OmniScan, which increases conspicuity of subtle lesions. It is also very useful for looking at disc herniation versus scar tissue, and it's used for MR angiograms in some centers. Some places have suggested that there's lower nephrotoxicity, however, this has not been proven till now. This is an example of an MR angiogram, and here we have the aorta, and you can see the yellow arrows showing the renal arteries arising from the aorta. There's very nice contrast resolution between the surrounding fat and the contrast enhanced. Negative MRI contrast agents include the superparamagnetic iron oxide particles. They're very, very small. Ultra-small superparamagnetic iron oxide are another type of um, molecule which are even smaller than iron. They can be used for liver and spleen imaging because Kupfer cells normally take up iron particles and these normal tissues will appear dark and if somebody has a lesion in their liver it will appear bright in comparison to the dark background. Ferrumoxtran is another example of SPIO agent. It's used for con prostate cancer evaluation and specifically for lymph node involvement. Normal lymph nodes take it up and become dark, whereas metastases to lymph nodes will look bright in comparison. Now I'll talk about NSF and what happens when you use MRI contrast agents in patients who are nephrogenic systemic fibrosis is a rare disease which causes progressive fibrosis in the tissues. There are between two and three hundred cases which have been confirmed worldwide up until now and it can occur within two weeks up to a month after exposure to gadolinium based contrast agents in patients who have impaired renal function. In patients with NSF they get painful thick itchy skin. They can develop joint contractures, and it may involve solid organs in which 5 to 10 percent of patients, sorry, 5 to 25 percent of patients can die from organ failure. NSF is diagnosed with a skin biopsy, and there's no effective. This is an example of a patient who has NSF. Typically, they get thick, itchy, and woody skin, and eventually joint until 2006, gadolinium-based contrast agents were thought to be safe, and these were used in patients with renal failure when they couldn't undergo CT scans for the same reason. NSF was first recognized in 1997, but the link between gadolinium-based contrast agents, renal impairment, and NSF was not made until 2006. So in 2007, the FDA produced a warning against using patients using gadolinium-based contrast agents in patients with severe renal function and basically to screen patients with any possible renal dysfunction. The cause for NSF is not exactly known, but there is this transmetallation theory. Essentially, 95% of cases who have had NSF have been exposed to gadolinium-based contrast agents within three months. All of the patients had EGFRs of less than 30 mL per minute or hepal. So normally, the gadolinium agents are chelated in a molecule, and we know that free gadolinium is toxic to the body. 
Now, conditions where the contrast agent is in circulation for much longer periods of time, such as in patients with acute or chronic renal failure, there may be some physiologic conditions which may lead to dissociation of the gadolinium from the chelate, and it's possible that this gadolinium in the tissues or in the blood itself may cause transmetallation, which means it switches position with possibly iron or other um, metal within normal tissues, and it may lead to NSF. This is particularly a problem in patients with chronic renal failure or acute renal failure who also have high levels of iron or high levels of acid. So patients on dialysis are at greater risk. Patients who have high iron, calcium, zinc, or copper levels also have an increased risk of this transmetallation where the gadolinium may switch with a normal iron particle in a tissue. Patients who have high doses of erythropoietin, patients with, who have acidosis, may increase the uh, dissociation of the chelate and the gadolinium, and the number of exposures to gadolinium and the dose of the gadolinium given. Other risk factors which may lead to NSF include pro-inflammatory states, such as recent surgery, infection, or some sort of vascular event, such as heart attack or stroke, hepatorenal syndrome, hyperphosphatemia, acidosis. So just as in CT, there are various stages of chronic renal disease using the same table as for CT scan. We're most concerned with the patients who are in stage 3, 4, and 5. According to a webcast by Dr. Goldfarb and Williamson in 2007 and based on the FDA warnings, uh, the FDA produced a box warning placed on the gadolinium boxes which say the following. The warning should state that in patients with severe kidney insufficiency who receive gadolinium-based agents, they are at risk for developing a debilitating and potentially fatal disease known as NSF. In addition, patients just before or just after liver transplant or those with chronic liver disease are also at risk for developing NSF if they experience kidney insufficiency of any severity. Severe is defined as stage 4, which is less than 30 mls per milliliter per minute per 1.7 millimeter squared. There's a website you can go to to look up these warnings as well. So what should we be doing? In outpatients who are here for elective MRI, we can screen using a history questionnaire for end-stage renal disease. We can also screen for acute recent illness, including liver dysfunction. And we can calculate estimated GFR when indicated, and that includes in patients who are diabetic, older, or who have not passed these questionnaires. In patients, we should calculate their eGFR for each patient and screen for renal disease, as well as in ICU patients for acute illness, such as hepatorenal disease. We also should try to prevent doing MRI in patients who are at high risk. So first of all, determine that gadolinium is required for the test. Consult with the referring physician to make sure it's indicated. Consider alternate tests and consider prompt dialysis, although dialysis has not been shown to necessarily prevent the development of an NSF in all cases. Peritoneal dialysis is not helpful. So the final part of this talk is on what to do if we have a patient who develops an allergy to dye, whether it's CT or MR. The risk of developing contrast allergy to CT dye is much higher than MR. And these are usually idiosyncratic reactions. So idiosyncratic reactions to intravenous dye used in CT typically re occur within 20 minutes of the injection. And a severe idiosyncratic reaction can occur after injection of less than one milliliter of contrast agent. Although some of the reactions may have similar manifestations as anaphylactic reactions, these are not true hypersensitivity. Studies have been shown or done which show that there are no IgE antibodies involved and previous sensitization is not required. These reactions do not consistently recur in a given patient, although the risk of having a contrast allergy is higher in patients who have had previous contrast allergies. These idiosyncratic reactions are anaphylactoid reactions, not anaphylactic, and symptoms can be classified as mild, moderate. Minor reactions include itchiness, rhinorrhea, nausea, brief vomiting, diaphoresis, dizziness, and coughing. 
Patients with mild symptoms should be observed for progression evolution or regression of the symptoms. If more severe reaction occurs, treatment is required. However, for minor reactions, usually we just watch it. For urticaria, if it's asymptomatic, no re treatment is required. If it's symptomatic, diphenhydramine can be given, Benadryl, 50 milligrams, orally, intramuscularly, or intravenous. For moderate reactions, which include persistent vomiting, diffuse urticaria, severe headache, facial edema, palpitations, tachycardia or bradycardia, abdominal cramps, and hypertension. In these cases, we should... So for the more severe reactions, we definitely need to intervene. These more severe reactions include life-threatening arrhythmias such as ventricular tachycardia, hypotension, bronchospasm, laryngeal edema, pulmonary edema, seizures, syncope, and death. Risk of death is quite low, less than 1 in 10,000. So treatments of major reactions. For bronchospasm at the Ottawa Hospital, calling the race team is a good idea. If, the if there's only mild bronchospasm, it can be treated with oxygen through a non-rebreather mass, mask, close observation, Ventolin treatment. If the symptoms become moderate or severe, more invasive treatment is needed. For moderate treatment without hypotension, one in a thousand epinephrine can be injected intramuscularly, usually between 0.3 and 0.5 mils, and repeated every five minutes as needed. Giving doses of less than 0.3 mils is um, not advised. And if more is required than one mil, it is possible that further intervention is required and the race team should have been called. In severe reactions, a slow intravenous injection of 1 in 10,000 epinephrine can be injected over 5 to 10 minutes, but this is usually done under the supervision of a race team. In patients with laryngeal angioedema, again, the race team should be called early. With mild treatment, this can be include oxygen at 10 to 12 liters by non-rebreather mass as well as Ventolin. Moderate to severe reactions can be treated with epinephrine sub, uh, intramuscularly at 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 mils of 1 to 1,000 concentration and once stable the patient should be given hydrocortisone although this does not typically begin working until six hours later but it can prevent recurrence of the symptoms. Again if the patient is very severe in their reaction, uh, race team should be called, and in some cases they need to be intubated. Patients with previous idiosyncratic reaction may react again. So the re rate of repeat reaction is 3.3 to 6.9 times higher than the general population. But these idiosyncratic reactions can occur to anyone at any time, whether they have had previous reactions or not, whether they have history of asthma, allergy to other medications, or allergies to food. 60% of patients who have had hives after injection of contrast agents in the past have hives with repeat exposure. However, patients with facial edema may have a recurrence rate of up to 68%. So the more serious the problems, the more serious the reaction may be the, sec the next time around. But it doesn't mean that they will have a reaction. So in the cases of patients who've had serious prior reactions, we should strongly consider not performing a CT scan with contrast if not necessary, or perhaps changing to an MRI. In patients who have had less severe reactions, they can be pretreated with prednisone, 13 hours, 7 hours, and 1 hour prior to injection of contrast agent, as well as 50 milligrams of oral diphenhydramine. Studies are ongoing to determine whether this will actually prevent the reaction in all patients because it has been shown in some studies that it is not going to necessarily prevent a reaction in every single patient. In patients with metformin, this is an oral antihyperglycemic medication and it's excreted predominantly in the kidneys and it's in patients who have diabetes. It's not nephrotoxic to kidneys per se, but patients who receive metformin
can become azotemic, and this may reduce life-threatening lactic acidosis in, in patients who receive contrast agents with iodine. So in patients who have metformin, it's not an allergy to the contrast, but these patients should have discontinuation of the metformin prior to the CT scan, and it should be withheld for 48 hours after the contrast-enhanced CT scan. The administration of metformin should be resumed after checking that there has been no significant renal dysfunction as a result of the CT scan. So in conclusion, we have covered CT contrast agents, contrast-induced nephropathy, MRI agents, nephrogenic systemic reactions, or nephrogenic systemic fibrosis as a re result of MRI agents, and what to do if a patient has an allergy to contrast, and what to do in patients who are on metformin. I hope that this is useful to you, and if you have any questions, please come any ask any of the radiologists, and we'd be happy to answer any further questions you have. Thank you.